Today I'm going to be doing a playthrough of Pokemon Yellow with only a Mankey. When I released my Pikachu video back in December, I got a lot of comments mentioning how Pikachu isn't actually supposed to beat Brock, because you have access to Pokemon like Nidoran Male and Mankey early on. This fighting type pig monkey is just the perfect option if you want to take on the rock hard Pokemon trainer, so that's why I've decided to use it today in a solo playthrough. Let's see how it can do. With every solo challenge we need some self-imposed rules, so here are mine, and I've also left them in the description so you can reference them later on if you need to. In the spirit of adding a bit more consistency to my Pokemon playthroughs, I've started to plan more before doing my initial attempt at each run. So this time, in order to plan even better than I have in the past, I actually looked up some secondary sources before going into this challenge. The unfortunate thing though with Poketube is that most people are playing red or blue, and in this case I'm going to be playing through Pokemon Yellow, which is quite different from those other two games. So in this case I was able to find three videos of other people playing through Pokemon Red with only a Mankey. We'll all recognize JRose11 who did a Mankey playthrough, and in addition to his video, which we've all probably seen, there's also two videos, one by Goldifish and one by the Neville level. So after watching those videos, I've identified a couple areas where Mankey might end up struggling. The first area is at Misty, and Misty has great special moves, especially with Bubble Beam, and Mankey's special is just really bad, so I'm gonna have to be careful there. The next spot that I noticed is the juggler in Koga's gym. He has four psychic type Pokemon, and then the following juggler has a Hypno, and so I'm gonna wanna be careful there because getting hit by super effective psychic moves can be really harmful to Mankey. After that, I think of course it makes sense to do Blaine first instead of Sabrina, but Sabrina does lack good AI in yellow, so she's actually going to be easier to take on than she would be in red and blue. Finally, j -Rose struggled against the final rival fight before the League, and that's largely because Execute's Stun Spore. Getting your speed cut by half is just brutal. He used Mimic with Agility to get past the fight, but I don't think that's going to really be an option for my playthrough, since Giovanni's team is at higher levels than they are in Red and Blue. I think I'm just going to need to level up too much for that final gym fight, and that I think will make the final rival fight much easier. One thing that j -Rose also mentioned is that Bruno was scary and inconsistent. Now, I don't know if that's something that my ego can fully deal with, so, uh, uh I just like, I'm kind of scared for that part of the run. I'm hoping that it's going to go well, but we're going to have to find out. Finally, I want to mention that Lance is significantly harder in yellow than he is in red and blue. j -Rose mentions how Lance likes to spam agility with all of his Pokemon because they're psychic type moves, and Mankey is a fighting type. But in yellow, their movesets have been changed so that they don't have agility. So I'm really scared for Aerodactyl, who's also been given stab flying type moves, which he doesn't have in red and blue. So Mankey could struggle there as well. After collecting all this information, I put a plan together for myself. Here it is, just in case you're curious. I always do these, they're quite short in their point form. They point out the most important things for me to do. I also have sort of a script behind the scenes of all the regular stuff that I do in challenges. So unless it's mentioned here, I'm gonna be doing my sort of standard approach to things, picking up elixirs and PP ups where I regularly would. So Mankey's stats are quite honestly pretty good for a solo playthrough. It's got high attack and good speed, giving it a 13.67% chance to critical hit. Now, that's going to be really relevant very soon. Unfortunately, the little angry pig monkey doesn't have much going for it in terms of bulk. 40 HP, 35 defense, and 35 special. Like, it's just really not going to take hits well. I've noted before in my playthroughs that playing with Pokemon that are glass cannons feels really good and they feel like they can get extremely fast times. However, when they get too glass cannon-y, like a Pokemon like Starmie, it actually starts to feel like their consistency starts to fall apart. Like, yeah, they're great and competitive when they can just one-shot everything, but in this kind of format where you're doing a playthrough and you have to take on trainer after trainer, you can just end up losing a few extra fights against random NPCs and accumulating more resets as a result. However, I don't want to jinx this and I'm happy to have this high attack stat and high speed stat today. I'm just going to be a little bit more stressed throughout the playthrough because like random trainers are going to scare me. <laughs> Mankey's starting moveset is Scratch and Leer and you'll notice that at level 9 it learns Low Kick. Now just in case you don't know, in red and blue it actually doesn't learn Low Kick, but in yellow this was updated. Likely because of the fact that you're only given Pikachu at the beginning who is like the worst starter to go up against Brock with. So today I think I'm only going to need level 9 to take on Brock so I don't need to gain that much experience early on in the game. So I'll be skipping the optional fight, and as a result, he'll choose Flareon. There are some downsides to this approach, it is going to make things easier for me, but overall, I think it's going to give Mankey the best possible time. 
Training for this optional fight would take a long time, especially because the Spiro knows Peck, which is super effective against Mankey. And like I just mentioned, its stats and its defenses are pretty bad. So I don't want to go up against this super effective move so early on without training. And then if I trained, I think it would just make Brock trivial. So I'm skipping the optional rival fight today and I'm going to take Brock on right away. Now I want to take a moment to explain Low Kick in Generation 1 and in Generation 2. So Brock's the rock hard Pokemon trainer and his Pokemon are honestly pretty heavy. In Generation 1, yeah, there I go again. <laughs> in Generation 1, Low Kick has a base power of 50 and it has an accuracy of 90%. It also has a 30% chance to cause the target to flinch. And a little bit of arcane knowledge here from Bulbapedia, it actually can't make the target flinch if the target is behind a substitute. But of course this is not going to be relevant for us because the only Pokemon that knows substitute that I'm going to face is Agatha's Gengar. In Generation 3, Low Kick was basically completely redesigned. It now has 100% accuracy and its power is dependent on the weight of the target. So it inflicts greater damage the heavier the target is. Its power is calculated in tiers, so at the lowest weight it does 20 power, and at the highest weight it does 120 power. So just remember that in generation 1 and 2 it doesn't work this way, it's just a base 50 power move with 90% accuracy, and it has a 30% chance to flinch. And with that explanation out of the way, let's get into the Brock fight. And for this fight I want to play you my live reaction that I had when I was playing it. So here it is. I got low kick, I'm only level 9, I think I can do it though. Okay, so I have to... Oh, Geodude misses. I miss. Ah, uh, uh, fighting moves. Fighting moves are the worst. Okay, Screech. That's really bad. Hopefully it doesn't use Bind. Oh, it uses Bind. Wonderful. Two hits? No, three hits. Okay, first reset. Oh, no. So that didn't go very well. On the second fight, I was able to knock the Geodude out with two low kicks, and it actually ended up missing tackle. So I arrive at the Onyx with full HP. But then something unfortunate happens. Because the Onyx is level 12, and honestly it's a pretty speedy snake, it outspeeds me and uses Bide first turn. I hit it with a critical hit low kick, doing half damage, and that's absorbed by the Bide. So I had to make a decision here. Now if it's a two turn Bide, it's going to deal damage back to me and knock me out if I don't get a critical hit. So I decided to switch into Leer to try and tank the first Bide and then knock it out over two more turns. However, then it unleashes energy and knocks Mankey out in a single hit. So I've lost twice against Brock. This is not going well. The third fight surprisingly opens exactly the same way, with Geodude missing its tackle, and I knock it out, moving on to the Onyx with full HP. Onyx comes out next, misses Bind, and I hit it with Low Kick for around one quarter damage. Next it uses Bide, and I go second again using Low Kick, but I miss. So it's not accumulating any energy this time. I switch into Leer, and I wait it out. When it finally unleashes energy and I can use low kick again, I think that I'm going to knock it out in a single turn, but it survives with a sliver of health. Ah, Brock is so annoying. But on the next turn I knock it out, and with that I've defeated Brock. Honestly on the final turn I probably should have used Scratch just for the increased accuracy, but I've defeated Brock either way and I'm moving on. With my mind a bit clearer over the vacation, I actually started to realize some mistakes that I'm making in my regular yellow playthrough routing, and so I'm going to start bringing these improvements into my playthroughs now in the new year. However, the opening of the game is pretty much the same as it always has been. I use the Pewter Mart here to buy some Pokeballs, just in case I run into a Spearow in a couple of the grass patches I have to walk through before I get repels. I also grab a single burn heal, because... Yes, there is no heal on the SSN. Everyone commented on my Venomoth video that there is a healing room. There's no heal! <laughs> on the next route, I actually run into a stressful bug catcher. Like, this shouldn't be stressful, but it is. Uh, I think it's largely because Mankey's low kick is not very effective, so I have to rely on Scratch here, and honestly, Scratch is just not very good. I finally get through the fight, and I get to use one of those potions that I bought. That's specifically why I buy them. And then on the very next fight, I get poisoned against this trainer, and yeah, that's why I buy three antidotes for a total of four. There's actually one hidden one in Viridian Forest that I always pick up. Mount Moon's next, and here I'm actually going to start skipping the HP up that I usually was grabbing. The reason that I'm skipping this HP up is that the encounters that you can get in Mount Moon are really unpredictable. You can run into like a million Zubats trying to get down to this like one vitamin. And I just don't think that that's good for a Pokemon's playthrough time. Skipping it and prioritizing the rare candy and the escape rope just makes a lot more sense. Later on, I can get the HP up if I really want it for a Pokemon, but overall, I'm just going to be skipping this one. The final important item to pick up in Mount Moon is Mega Punch, and I teach this to Mankey right away. 
It's a higher power replacement for Scratch. Unfortunately, its accuracy is not all that good, so it's basically 50%. In preparation for the Nugget Bridge rival who has a Spearow with Peck, I want to level up a few more times in Mount Moon, so I fight a few optional trainers here in order to do that. During these fights, I learn the move Karate Chop, and I need to explain it because in Generation 1, it functions very differently than it does in any other generation. Here, it's a 50 base power normal type move with 100% accuracy. So Karate Chop is a high critical hit ratio move, meaning that it'll score critical hits more often than other moves, like Slash, Razor Leaf, and Crab Hammer. Yeah, Crab Hammer is a high critical hit rate move. I can't wait to do a Kingler playthrough. Here's a list of critical hit rates based on speed, and you can see that I've made a category for high crit moves. And if we scroll down, you'll notice that at level 64, we get to a place where I've labeled it as guaranteed critical hits. And that means that if your Pokemon has 64 or greater base speed, it's basically guaranteed to get a critical hit with a high critical hit ratio move. So I was really excited to start using Karate Chop, uh, and then this happened. Yeah, it just like disabled my Karate Chop. Like, come on. <laughs> ah, so frustrating. Anyways, well, I guess I'll get to use it in the Jesse and James fight. And so I actually filmed this fight just because I wanted to show off using Karate Chop for the first time, like without the disable and everything. Yeah, and then uh, I'm glad that I filmed this fight. So here's my live reaction. Record Jesse and James today. Uh, I don't know why I feel like it, but they're usually really bad. Rap is annoying, but it's not going to be enough. Oh, low kick missed. That's twice. Come on. Are you kidding me? Okay, this could actually get annoying, because the coughing is... Ah! <laughs> okay! Oh my gosh. Well, that was way more stressful than it needed to be. In Cerulean City, I pick up the rare candy, and then I decide to face the rival before Misty. Again, Mankey has awful special, so I really don't want to take her on with her water-type moves. The rival opens with Spearow, and it uses Growl right away, lowering my attack, and then I take it out on the second turn. Next is Santru, and here Karate Chop is the best move again. I have to take it out over three turns, and luckily it doesn't use Sand Attack. And now I'm at the Rotata, and once I'm here, it's just very easy. I can use Low Kick to knock out his two remaining Pokemon, and with that, I'm proceeding to Nugget Bridge. Here, I fight a few more trainers just to level up a bit more before Misty. I don't want to fight her when I'm underleveled and incur a bunch of resets. After all, Brock was harder than he should be, and like, he's already really hard. Again, he's the rock solid Pokemon trainer, and he has an Onix, which has like so much defense. Anyways, he was way harder than he should have been, and Misty is, uh, yeah, I don't want Misty to be hard as well. I ended this training by fighting this optional rocket here, and like, oopsies, I actually lost to the rocket. I really wanted to obtain Dig before Misty. But yeah, that didn't go so well, so I guess I get an extra reset anyways. In my starters video, I mentioned how Blastoise was like the least well suited for a solo playthrough just because of its high defense stat, but honestly that's not always true. When your defense is extremely low, it just feels really bad. And in this case, Mankey's low defense and low special, which is a defensive stat in this generation, causes it to have a lot of fragility. So in Misty's gym, I end up fighting the optional trainer. Again, I want more levels. I don't want to lose again. And then I teach Dig to Mankey just before I take her on. In Generation 1, Dig has a base power of 100. It's actually the same base power as Earthquake. They're basically the same move. Dig just takes place over two turns. So right now, Karate Chop, after getting a critical hit, has 91 power. So Dig is actually more powerful, but this banks on the fact that Misty isn't going to use an X Defend or Harden on the first turn. If she does, though, I can then switch into Karate Chop and bypass the stat changes with critical hits. I use Dig first turn, I connect with a Staryu, and knock it out in one hit. Okay, that's really encouraging. Starmie's next. Misty uses Harden, then I go underground, and then she uses an X Defend. Okay, so that's like the worst possible two turns for me to be using Dig. When I finally connect, it doesn't do very much damage. Starmie hits Mankey with Water Gun, dealing around one quarter damage, and then my Karate Chop connects. Okay, so that takes it into orange health. Alright, I think that I can do this, maybe it only needs two more hits. Starmie uses Harden again, which is useless against Karate Chop, and then I knock it out with my next hit. Okay, so that was really good actually. I'm impressed at how well Mankey managed her. Before heading south, I grab a couple extra potions and sell some items in the Mart. I just really want to be prepared, especially for the last that has all of these Pidgeys with Sand Attack. It can get really annoying against her. Some of you mentioned that you're able to skip her if you keep the maximum distance between you and her, but you actually can't, so I have to take her on. Today she's easy, and I'm moving on to the SSN. I pick up the TM for Rest here, as well as the TM for Body Slam. 
I might end up needing it later on, but overall I'm probably not going to teach it to Mankey and I'm going to rely on Karate Chop instead, because after all it has more power than Body Slam after it's landing critical hits. The third rival on the SSN is usually really easy to take out, and today that's really the case. Mankey's overleveled now, and a fighting move in the form of Low Kick is really helpful against both Rotata and Eevee. So the trash cans are next, and uh, yeah, here's how I reacted to them. Hey, hey, oh, come on. I went, did I go to the wrong can? I went, oh, oh, sweet. Oh my gosh. Oh, I'm so bad at this game. <laughs> oh, I gotta learn this puzzle. I gotta actually just spend the time and learn it. Okay, it's gonna be up here. No, it's not. It's down here. Uh, where is it? Okay, it's this one, right? Or is it the center one? I don't know. Ah. So in yellow, it's not always guaranteed that there's a, a, a can. Oh, yes. Okay, this one's this can, I believe. Yep. Good. Okay, I did it. Surge is next. And today, I remembered to heal before this fight, so that feels really good. He uses X speed first on Raichu, and that allows Mankey to get underground without taking any damage. My dig connects, and it knocks Raichu out in a single turn because of a critical hit. All right, so that was probably the easiest gym leader yet. It's uh, it's just getting easier, and I hope that that continues. Please let this trend continue. I dig back to Cerulean using Diglett's Cave, and then I pick up the bike. And it's worth noting here that there's actually no text glitch in yellow from the bike man. They fixed that. Um, plus, it's against the rules anyways, because I don't allow myself to use glitches. So yeah, that's why I don't use the uh, bike tech speed glitch. On the next route, we have to face the wrapping lass, and... Uh, it's actually more like the rapping junior trainer now that I actually like read the in-game text. Ah, uh, oops. <laughs> Anyways, she's easy to take on and with that I'm moving on to the tunnel. At this point in the run you might ask the question, why aren't you just evolving into a primate? And this is a really common question. For these solo challenge videos, I really like to use first stage Pokemon, and that's just because I want this to be as hard as possible. I want to use Primeape for a versus video in the future, but I actually can't decide who it should go up against. Right now I'm thinking Rapidash. I want to do Arcanine vs Ninetales by the way, and so Rapidash is sort of the fire Pokemon that's left out, and so I think it could be a good adversary for Primeape, especially because it has uh, higher stats than Primeape, and that makes up for the fact that it only learns basically Ember. Like, it learns Fire Spin, but Fire Spin is really bad. So if you have an idea about who Primeape should go up against, put it in the comments. I promise I try to read all of them. It's getting much harder lately. In Rock Tunnel, I tend to oversave, and this is just because I don't want to get stuck at any of these trainers. The Slowpoke are a bit annoying to deal with because they're psychic types today, but I move on from them without issues. I finally arrive at the Hiker with the self-destructing team, and I save just in case. However, this time the fight goes really well. I dig underground, first Geodude self-destructs. Then I hit the second Geodude, and then Graveler comes out. As soon as I go underground, it just blows up. <laughs> okay, so that was like the easiest hiker fight ever. I'm moving on. In the tunnel between Lavender Town and Celadon City, there's a hidden elixir. I used to always grab this, but now if I miss it on my first attempt, I just don't pick it up and I pass it by. I pick up so many ethers and elixirs along the way anyways that this one just isn't required. I don't want to waste time here picking up an item that I'm not going to need. In the department store, I buy my repels, my great balls, I sell a bunch of stuff. I actually almost sold Thunderbolt, and it's really good that I didn't, I guess, because Mankey can in fact learn Thunderbolt. Uh, does that make sense? I don't think so, but that's okay. I uh, might end up using it later, we'll see. I buy a TM for Reflect and Submission, these could be useful later on. Uh, submission deserves some discussion, like some pros and cons. Uh, it's really bad. It's a lot of cons, actually. 80% <laughs> accuracy is just terrible, and it also does recoil damage. So the pros are that it's like a really good fighting move, and it gets stab. That's nice with Mankey, but the cons, I think, outweigh it, so I'm gonna try and avoid teaching it. Like, again, I have this, like, unspoken fifth rule of my playthroughs that it should never teach submission to my Pokémon. Yeah, I hate this move. <laughs> I buy two Pokedolls, one for the Pokemon Tower to skip the Marowak, and one for Copycat so I can obtain Mimic. I grab a Freshwater for the guards to Saffron City, and then a Soda Pop so that I can get Rock Slide. And yeah, Mankey learns Rock Slide, but Kabutops and Omastar don't. Ugh, I guess also Aerodactyl doesn't. It's just painful. In Generation 1, it actually is only a damage dealing move. It has no secondary chance to flinch. So that's a key note. Next I obtain my flyer, and I save before I'm doing this, because I'm a fighting type, and this can go poorly when you're fighting a Doduo. Like, it was so close, I'm so lucky that I caught it without having to reset. Anyways, with that, I finally get my PP up, and now it's time for the tower. 
The fourth rival fight is next, and today I'm kind of worried for this because Mankey's pretty underleveled. It has learned Rock Slide at this point though, so that's really going to help against the Furo. But it doesn't knock it out, allowing it to use a mirror move and do some damage to me before it finally faints. Next is Magnemite, and of course Dig takes care of it in a single hit. Shelter follows, and it lacks the Ice type, so a low kick would not be a good choice here. I use Karate Chop, it doesn't knock it out, and then it confuses me, leading to me hitting myself once before I finally knock it out. Luckily I snapped out a Confusion on the way, so I get to dig against the Sand True and almost knock it out in a single turn. But then it starts to set up Sand Attack. Ugh, I hate this. So my accuracy gets lowered twice by this awful move before I finally take the Shrew out. Now against the Eevee, I'm just really hoping that Low Kick will connect. And lucky for me, on the first turn it does, and I've defeated the rival. In the tower I fight some of the optional Chandler, but not too many. I'm actually putting together a giant spreadsheet so that I can calculate the amount of experience that all these trainers give me. So I've been fighting these Chandler in most playthroughs when the Pokemon can learn Dig, but it actually turns out that the experience yields in here are really bad. It averages around one Pokemon per trainer battle, and also I have to get through all of the animations then for each fight. It also trains Mankey's special more than its attack because it's gaining stat experience equal to Ghastly's base stats. So that's a lot of special stat experience when I want attack stat experience. At the top of the tower, Jesse and James are a cakewalk, and with that, the region really opens up and now I have a bunch of choices to make. Where do I want to go to next? I can go to Sylph and do some training, I can take on Erica, or I can actually head south to Fuchsia City. Today, I think I'm going to start with the last of these options because I can do some training west of Celadon, and that'll give me a lot of attack stat experience. Unfortunately over here, things are not as easy as you think they'd be. The poison types are easy, but Machop with Karate Chop is just like really annoying. And then I have this really scary fight. Like, this was way too close when I'm just training against a random NPC. Again, just bringing up that point that I made earlier on in the video, when Pokemon are frail and glass cannons, it can be pretty stressful when playing these playthroughs. I complete the Safari Zone, grab the Golden Teeth, and Surf. After that, I forget that I don't have Erica's badge, and I try to get the rare candy from behind this boulder. Uh, oops. I actually forgot that you need Erica's badge for strength. Now, I don't want to do Koga next because he has psychic type moves, so I'm going to go to Sylph and do some more training. At level 40, I'll take on Erica. I waited this long to face her just because she has strong special attackers, and Mankey's special is awful. This fight was a bit scary, but I end up winning without too many issues. After that, I finish off my training in Sylph. Here the experience yields are actually much better per Pokemon than they are in Pokemon Tower, so it does make more sense to train here. Also these trainers disappear once you defeat Giovanni, so there's no coming back to fight them later on if I need to level up. All of this culminates with my first fight against the Sylph rival. He opens with Sand Slash. I use Dig against it, and then it uses Swift, which does hit Pokemon when they're underground, so that's pretty frustrating. After that I switch into Karate Chop, it uses Slash, taking me all the way down to 14 hit points, and then I knock it out. Cloister's next. I use Rock Slide, it takes it down to half health, and then it finishes me off with a Roar Beam. Alright, so that fight did not go well. I now need to make a decision if I'm going to use Rare Candies or not. I've accumulated enough at this point in the playthrough to just level up and take the rival out with ease. I could also teach Mankey Submission in the place of Low Kick, but honestly I really don't like that option. Like, having Submission instead of Low Kick is just not going to feel good, and there's no move reminder in Generation 1, so I'm not going to be able to learn Low Kick back ever again once I delete it. Instead I decide to train in the Dojo, because these Pokemon have great experience yields, there's basically no walk time between fights, and they're also going to give me a lot of stat experience for my attack stat. Then I made what I think is a mistake. I decided to fight Koga, and this seems to normally be the correct choice in like almost every playthrough. I'll start defaulting to this in the future to avoid resets against the rival, but here I'm not sure it's the right choice. I was just hoping that Rock Slide would be enough to take out all of his bugs. So let's see how it goes. The first three Venonats are actually one hits with Rock Slide, and that leads to Venomoth, so this is going really well. Koga uses an X attack on it first turn, and Rock Slide doesn't KO. Okay, that's like really bad. Psychic hits me, and it gets a critical hit, knocking Mankey out. Okay, so that's not good, but that was a critical hit, so that's luck, and that made me think that I could do it. So I attempted again for a second time. And on the second fight, I realized that Venomoth is actually moving first. I didn't notice this during the first fight, and so this isn't going to work. I'm going to need to train more. Koga's Venomoth has 103 speed, so if I'm going to defeat him, I'm probably going to need to have at least 104 speed. I train up until my speed's 102, and then I feed Mankey two Carbos to get it to 104. On my third fight against Koga, Rock Slide misses, and that leads to a defeat, so... Ah, Rock Slide, again, another frustrating move that doesn't have 100% accuracy. On my fourth fight, I was feeling optimistic, uh, so here's the live audio. Check it out. That's why I hate this move. 
Okay. Come on. Just use an X attack on it. Ah. Uh, oh! Hype. Okay, cry chop, cry chop. Ooh, I did it. Koga is no more. I head back to Sylph to take on the rival. I should have probably opened with Dig, but instead I choose Karate Chop. The reason that Dig would be better is because Sand Slash knows Slash, and it has a high critical hit ratio, and it does a lot of damage. I figured this out second turn, use Dig, it almost knocks the Sand Slash out, and then I finish it off with another Karate Chop. Now I'm moving on to the Cloister. Low Kick knocks it out in a single hit, the following Magneton goes down to a single hit from Dig, and then Kadabra gets taken out by a guaranteed critical hit from Karate Chop. The final Pokemon that remains is Flareon, and it's pretty slow, and I have Dig. So remember at the beginning of the video when I said that making the rival choose Flareon would make this run overall much easier? Yeah, this is why. I take it out with one hit, and I'm moving on. I completely steamroll Giovanni next. He's so easy for Mankey to deal with. Usually the Rhyhorn is the most annoying Pokemon to deal with in this fight because it's a rock type, but Low Kick just gets the job done. After that, I head to the mansion, and this is another place where my spreadsheet is telling me that training is actually really efficient. So I fight some of the optional trainers here just to gain some more levels. I continue this in Blaine's gym, and it's important to remember that in yellow you can't just talk to these trainers to fight them, you have to answer the quiz first. In red and blue you can just talk to them right away and fight them, it's great, it's much better. But in yellow, answering all the questions wrong is the fastest way. Blaine got a big buff in yellow, like he's much better in these games, but he's still not that good, and I don't even think I need to heal against him. Healing is just wasting time at this point. And Mankey runs circles around him today, one-hitting all of his Pokemon with Dig. Sabrina's next, and in yellow they removed her good AI, so that means that she isn't going to spam only Psychic-type moves against Mankey. That makes things a little bit easier. However, there's something else I do need to explain here. On the right side of the screen, I'm showing you the Gym Leader's Pokemon and their current stats. These aren't their base stats. And now during major fights, I'm going to be showing my Pokemon's current stats as well instead of its base stats. The way that I'm doing this is I back up the save file that I make at the beginning of the fight, and then I just read that save file with a save editor later on, and in post I'll put in my current stats. So I actually don't know what my stats are unless I've checked them in the regular way using the summary page during these playthroughs. But we all get to see what they are in post. One thing you'll note going into this fight is that Mankey has 117 speed, which obviously lets it outspeed the Abra and knock it out. I level up and my speed goes up to 120, which is really convenient against the following Kadabra. That's two speed higher than the Kadabra. I move first and I knock it out as well. Up next is Alakazam though, and it has 133 speed, so it should be outspeeding me. However, Mankey moves first, gets a critical hit and takes it down to red health. Sabrina uses an X-Defend, and I finish it off with Karate Chop. So you're going to ask the question here, how did Mankey outspeed the Alakazam? It shouldn't have. Well here's the thing, I defeated Koga, and his badge gives me the badge boost for speed. That gives me a 12.5% boost to my stats in battle. So my current stats are actually modified, giving them an extra 12.5%. And that actually gives Mankey two extra speed than the Alakazam, allowing it to move first. I was pretty confused by this when I was first looking at this footage, I was just like, what is going on? But the badge boost. That's what's going on. It's not even the glitch, it's just the badge boost as it was intended. I take on Giovanni without fighting any of the optional trainers in his gym. I think that I can do it at this level. Again, the speed boost allows me to get past the Doug Trio and the Persian with ease while outspeeding them. So that's really nice. Nido Queen survives my dig with red health and then hits me with Earthquake, taking Mankey all the way down to 65 health. I knock it out with Karate Chop and move on to the Nido King. It also survives my hit, but then Giovanni's awful and uses a guard spec, giving me the free knockout. So, Rhydon's last, and we're gonna switch to my live reaction for this one. Now that low kick will just knock the Rhydon out. Oh, it did like nothing. Okay, dig. Also did like nothing, but funny enough, Giovanni's real bad. Oh, he's so bad. He's so bad. So many horn drills. Okay, <laughs> whatever. So that's definitely not the most consistent way to get by him, but at least I didn't have to teach Mankey submission. But I'll take it today because I'm trying to get the best possible playthrough time with this cute little pig monkey on my first attempt. Just before taking on the final rival, I'm going to pick up Mimic. Usually it ends up being the case that I arrive at the league, deposit all my Pokemon, and then realize like, Oops, I don't have Mimic. I have to withdraw all my Pokemon, then fly to Saffron. So today I'm not going to do that. I actually remembered to pick it up, and that feels really good. With that out of the way, I'm ready to face the final rival. He opens with Sand Slash. Karate Chop does around one-third damage to it, with obviously a critical hit, and then Slash does so much to Mankey, taking me down to half health. So that's not a good first turn. Second turn, I use Dig, I get a lucky critical hit, and knock Sand Slash out. The following Execute is the thing that I'm truly scared for, because it has Stun Spore, and getting paralyzed is going to cut my speed, and that makes the rest of the fight almost impossible. However, it uses Leech Seed instead, and so I knock it out over two turns. 
And then at Cloyster, everything starts to fall apart. I miss my low kick, Leech Seed does damage to me, and then it hits me with a Roar Beam. Okay, so that's really not good. My next low kick connects and takes it to half health, but then it heals with Leech Seed, and it confuses me with Supersonic. Okay, please, I need to attack next turn. I do, low kick connects, and it actually knocks Cloyster out, despite it being higher than half health. So, that's a bit surprising. So Magneton's next, and I looked at its moveset, like, look over to the side, there's its moveset, and I'm like, I got this, I just gotta use Dig. I use Dig, and then it hits me with Swift. So, there must be a mistake on Bulbapedia, because yeah, it has Swift, and it knocks me out. That's really frustrating. I try again immediately after to see if I can just get a better result if I get more lucky against the first Sand Slash. I use Dig against it this time, and it uses a lot of Poison Sting, so that's pretty good. It finishes off with Fury Swipes, which does almost nothing to me, and I go onto the Execute with Green Health. However, then it uses Stun Spore, and yeah, that's pretty much it for this fight. So I'm not going to outspeed pretty much anything now. Supersonic from the Cloister confuses me, and then it knocks me out with Aurora Beam. So that's an even worse result this second attempt. In the third fight, Execute uses Poison Powder, and it fails, so that's really nice. In Generation 1 and 2, all of the AI status moves have a 25% chance to fail, actually. So, that allows me to move on to the Cloister with no status condition, but then Low Kick just misses so many times and I faint, like... Ugh. At this point, I'm close enough to the end game that I think it's time to use some rare candies. Waiting for the highest possible level to use these really increases the amount of experience that they allow you to skip. So that's why I want to save them as long as possible. I level up three times, and then I try the rival again. I get a lucky critical hit against the Sand Slash with Dig on turn one. That's great, and it allows me to knock it out on the second turn with a single Karate Chop. Executes next, and it fails its Stun Spore. That's really good. Cloister's next. My low kick does more than half damage now, but it confuses me with Supersonic, leading to me hitting myself into confusion on the next turn. So I've got 66 health left. I think I can do this. Low Kick connects, gets a critical hit, and knocks the Cloister out. Okay, Magneton time. I snap out of Confusion, it doesn't use Swift when I'm underground, and I knock it out with a single dig. So the following Kadabra and Flareon are both going to be very easy. Karate Chop manages the Kadabra with ease, Flareon that follows is an easy one hit with dig. And with that, I'm moving on to the League. It's key to note here that Training in Victory Road actually has some of the best experience yields in the entire game. So on the way, I fight some optional trainers until I run out of healing potions and can't train anymore. Here are Mankey's stats and learn set before the league. Honestly, I'm feeling pretty good about this, but I'm pretty scared for Lance, specifically his Aerodactyl. It's very fast and it knows flying type moves, and it crits so much because of its 130 base speed. But if I can get by it, I think that the champion fight is actually going to be significantly easier. What do you think? Can Mankey do it? Let's find out. Lorelei opens with Dugong, and it has an 80% chance to use Rest on the second turn. So I do damage to it first turn, ensuring that it'll go to sleep on the second turn. After that, I can knock it out in two hits, and I move on to the following Cloister. I use Rock Slide against it, and I figure out that it's in three hit range. It actually gets a Super Potion, but that doesn't prevent it from fainting. I was really lucky here, because all my Rock Slides hit, even despite me being confused. But now, Slowbro is next, and this is the Pokemon that I'm most scared of. Lorelei has good AI. Well, she has good AI on all of her Pokemon except Dugong. It's very weird. And what good AI means is that the Slowbro is going to use moves against me that are super effective. And it determines which moves to use based exclusively on their type. So both Psychic and Amnesia are super effective against my fighting type. That means Slowbro is only going to use those two moves. Lorelei also has a secondary AI modification that forces her to use stat altering moves on the second turn that a Pokemon's in battle. So that means that the second turn Slowbro's out, it's going to use Amnesia. This time it spams Amnesia twice, and then it uses Psychic on the third turn and completely squashes Mankey. On the next fight I make it back to Slowbro and I realize something. For the first two turns I can use Karate Chop, because it's probably not going to KO me with its first Psychic if it uses it first turn, second turn I'm safe because it's going to use Amnesia, and then third turn I can dig and avoid a potential Psychic. However, this doesn't knock it out, but luckily it brings it into low health and triggers Lorelei to use a retroactive Super Potion. This is when she basically skips her move and uses a Super Potion instead of using her planned move. And in this case, that allows me to knock the Slowbro out and move on to Jinx for the first time. Okay, that's good. And then in a truly Scott's Thoughts moment, I use Dig against Jinx instead of Rock Slide or Low Kick. And then after that, Lorelei heals it with a Super Potion, and then I use Karate Chop. So, basically use the two best moves on my moveset in this case, and I'm really proud of that. Anyways, I am moving on to Lapras. 
I use Rock Slide against it for maximum damage. It connects, does half damage, but then Lapras uses Blizzard and completely wrecks Mankey. Okay, so I think I might need a slightly different strategy here. For my third attempt, I'm going to try with Submission. The main reason that I think that this move is going to help is because it's going to really help against Cloyster. I think I can now get it into two hit range, and then I can use Submission against the final Lapras to hopefully finish it off a little bit faster. However, then Cloyster gets me into a clamp and just wrecks me. Ah, so frustrating. It's typical for me when I reset after losing a fight to then teach new TMs and not save before I attempt the fight again. That gives me some flexibility if I want to roll back to an older moveset. So that's actually what happens here in the fourth fight. I forget to teach submission again, so I have to go into the fight with low kick again. I manage to get by the slow bro, and then I get to Jinx. Here I make the correct choice, use Rock Slide and knock it out in a single turn. Lapras is last. I use Rock Slide, do half damage. Lapras uses Body Slam, which doesn't knock Mankey out, and then I connect with my next Rock Slide, finishing the fight off. Okay, so I guess I'm moving on to uh, the trainer that's next. So we're going to have to decide if he deserves his true name, or if he's actually just a hiker today. And if J-Rose's video is any proof, I think that he's probably going to deserve his regular name. He opens with Onyx. I use Low Kick, it does over half damage, and then I finish it off on the next turn. It didn't take very much from Slam. Hitmonchan's next. I use Dig for maximum damage, it uses Fire Punch, luckily doesn't burn me, and then I knock it out. Hitmonlee's next. Here, the best thing to do is use Dig. It actually uses High Jump Kick, crashes, but in Generation 1 that only does one hit point of damage. That's pretty annoying. I finally manage to take it out and move on to the second Onyx. It hits me with a Screech, and then I finally knock it out, and Machamp is last. I hit it with Dig, it doesn't knock it out, even with a critical hit, and then it hits me with strength for so much damage. But luckily I survive with 9 hit points, and then I knock it out. Okay, he does deserve to be an Elite Four member today, because that was really tense. I'm just like so happy that I didn't lose. Now Agatha's next, and I'm going to summarize this one pretty quickly. Because honestly, if you have Dig, which is a physical type ground move, her Pokemon are really easy to knock out. I can one-shot all of the Ghosts and the Arbok, and I can use Rock Slide and Karate Chop against the Golbat. That's one of the reasons why I actually tend to skip it in consistent league tests, because if you have one of these moves and you outspeed, you're just going to win. Lance is next, and this is the one that I'm most scared for. It's a really good thing that I have Rock Slide. I use Rock Slide first turn, it doesn't KO the Gyarados, it uses Hyper Beam, and knocks me out with a critical hit. Okay, so that is not confidence inspiring. On the next fight, Gyarados lands a Hydro Pump and it does a lot of damage to Mankey. Then on the second turn, we both miss, it was very scary, and then I managed to knock the Gyarados out, moving on to the Dragonair. And this is the moment that I realized that I should have brought Mimic into this fight instead of Low Kick. Like it's really overstated, it's welcome. Mimic would allow me to steal Ice Beam from the second Dragonair once I knock it out, but this time that doesn't even matter because the second Dragonair hits me with Bubble Beam, lowers my speed, and then Aerodactyl finishes me off. On the next fight, I try out the Mimic strategy, I steal Ice Beam, I hit the Dragonair with it, but it survives. So yeah, Mankey's awful special stat is just really not helping here. That allows it to knock me out, and so I guess I've got to attempt again. In this case, the first Dragonair paralyzes me, and then the second one locks me in a wrap and knocks me out, so this really isn't going well. So I think that the best strategy here is just to use all of my remaining rare candies to level up to the maximum level and then see that if I can do it. If I can't, I'm going to have to black out and try this all over again. And now with Mankey at level 71, let's switch over to my live reaction. Lance again. Okay. <laughs> oh. So that's some pretty bad luck, but on the next fight I'm the one that gets good luck and I knock the Gyarados out without losing a single hit point. I move on to the Dragonair and I also get a perfect fight. It misses its slam and goes down without doing anything to me. I steal Ice Beam on the second Dragonair and then make a Scott's Thoughts mistake where I use Dig against the Dragonair, like whoops, uh, it doesn't knock it out and then it gets another turn to attack me, but luckily I take it out the next turn. Aerodactyl's next. I use Rock Slide because Rock doesn't actually resist Rock. It does a lot of damage but Aerodactyl survives and lands a wing attack, taking me down to red health. I take it out the next turn and Dragonite's last. And here's a live reaction for this fight. Ice Beam against Dragonite is four times effective. Oh, it doesn't knock it out. Okay, so like freeze maybe? Yes, freeze. <laughs> okay, I'm taking that. We're, we're running with that. Ah. Uh... So I'm moving on to the champion after a really lucky turn of events. That fight was so smooth.
He opens with Sand Slash and it doesn't know Swift anymore. So I use Dig, I take it out over two turns, and the following Alakazam is a one hit. That leads to Executor, and you wouldn't think that this thing would be super challenging. It doesn't know very many good moves, like Stomp is the best offensive move that it knows, but it uses Hypnosis, and I stay asleep for not one, not two, not three, not four, but five turns. I finally wake up and I'm able to knock it out, but at what cost? I don't have any recovery options, so I'm going to have to finish this fight at low health. I gamble against Magneton with Dig, it could use Swift, but it doesn't and I'm moving on to Cloyster. Here I'm going to need Rock Slide to get a critical hit and knock it out in one hit, but then it misses like is typical from Rock moves, and then Ice Beam knocks me out. On the next fight I realize that Sand Slash knows Slash. Uh, that just makes sense after its name and everything, so I decide I should mimic Slash because it's basically a souped up karate chop. However, this doesn't go well for me and I end up fainting, but I still think that this strategy has merit. I think it's going to allow me to knock out the Executor with greater ease. On the second fight, I mimic Slash first turn, and then I use it on the Sand Slash on the second turn. It does just under half damage, and then Sand Slash does around the same amount to me, so that's really not good. I use Dig next turn to try and avoid Sand Slash's Slash. You have to remember that Earthquake doesn't actually hit Pokemon when they're underground in Generation 1. Just another one of those quirks. I hit the Sand Slash, it doesn't quite knock it out, and then it lands Slash against me again, taking me all the way down to one hit point. Oh my gosh, I can't believe that I survived that. I knock it out next turn, and Alakazam's next. Slash finishes it off in one hit, but I have no recovery for Executor. I use Slash turn one and it does half damage, and Executor fails its hypnosis. Okay, this is good. I use Slash the next turn, and it knocks the pineapple tree out. Okay, Mankey, good job smashing those coconuts. Magneton's next, I dig, it uses Swift, and this fight's over. On the fourth fight, I'm able to get back to the Executor with Slash, but this time it puts me to sleep and wears me down again. So this isn't going the way that I want it to, but there's one move that can solve all of these problems, and I probably should have just taught it to Mankey earlier in the place of Karate Chop. And that move is my signature move, Rest. Unfortunately, on the next fight, with Rest, I make a mistake and I choose not to heal against the Executor. Like, that was my moment to heal. I do manage to take Magneton out, but then I faint on the Cloister because I just don't have enough health remaining to outlast it. So the lesson I learned there is just make sure that you heal when you get to the Pineapple Tree. On the next fight, Sand Slash gets lucky with a critical hit from Earthquake. Ah, that's annoying. And then on the seventh fight, Executor once again puts me to sleep and knocks me out. On the 8th fight, I faint to Sand Slash because it poisons me, so right now I'm noticing that my resets are around Pikachu tear, which is frustrating, but luckily Mankey is going through the game much faster. It hasn't really encountered a wall until Lance and now the Champion fight. I'm cautiously optimistic that in the next few fights things are going to line up the way that I need them to. But just because I do want to get through this as consistently and quickly as possible, I decide that I should teach Submission in the place of Rock Slide. And I know you're saying like, but never teach Submission. I know, but in this case I think that Submission is actually going to be much better against the Cloister, and that's the answer that I need to arrive at the final Flareon. Flareon has Reflect, which is a Psychic type move, and that means that it's just going to spam Reflect against me, so the final boss of this fight is actually the Cloister that I've been fighting this entire time. Slash allows me to get through the Sand Slash, the Alakazam, and the Executor. Dig is good for Magneton, and I arrive at Cloister. I use Submission, it connects for massive damage, and knocks Cloister out because of a critical hit. Okay, I'm moving on to the Flareon, so this is basically just a victory lap. It uses Reflect, I use Dig, it doesn't quite knock it out, but I get another chance to use Dig because it just keeps spamming Reflect, and with that, I've defeated Pokemon Yellow with only a Mankey. However, before I proceed and give the results from this challenge, I really want to go back and do some consistent tests against all these leaders to figure out what level Mankey would need to beat each of them in a consistent way. By uncovering this information, I would hope that in the future, if I reattempted this challenge, I would be able to get better results, hopefully less resets and a faster completion time. You might end up deciding to play this challenge on your own, and in that case, hopefully this information will be helpful. I train up a bit, increasing my level and giving me more stat experience before I start the league this time. Last time, Mankey was definitely too low, so a few extra levels here are just going to help. From here on, I'm going to be using rare candies, and in a regular playthrough, at this point I'd still have 8 remaining after I used the 3 against the final rival in my playthrough. If I was playing this playthrough again, I think it would be better to train earlier on in gyms, such as Erica's gym, Sabrina's gym, and Giovanni's gym. I didn't actually do any training in those places today with Mankey, and I think that that would be the fastest way to level up in order to have this level to start the league with. For Lorelei, I start the fight with a different moveset. I've added Submission in the place of Low Kick because it's going to do way more damage to the Cloister, and that allows me to get it in 2 hit range, but unfortunately I've taken too much damage the first time and I faint because of recoil damage. 
On the next fight, I make it past the Cloister because of a retroactive super potion, and then Slowbro uses Psychic first turn, but I survive it with 12 hit points, and that actually allows me to get all the way to Lapras, but then I faint. So there's an issue here, and that's just that I can't heal before the Lapras. I want to be able to survive one of its hits, so I think that rest is the solution for this fight. But what I realize is that this does not solve the problem of Slowbro. It can just knock me out when it gets there if it uses Psychic. And that doesn't feel very consistent, I'm just waiting for it to use Amnesia a bunch and then knock it out. So I decided that the best approach here is to level up a bit more. I'll tank its hits slightly better, and I'll deal out more damage. At level 68, here's what happens. The Dugong is still very easy, then Cloister comes out, and now Submission can one-hit it. That's very consistent, allowing me to proceed onto the Slowbro with green health. Because I'm arriving here with more health, I can now use Rock Slide first turn, I will survive its Psychic if it hits me first turn like it does in this fight, and then I can use Rock Slide second turn because it's going to use Amnesia. After that, I can just knock it out with Dig. However, the problem here is that I still lose to the Lapras that follows occasionally. However, there is a moveset that I believe is going to allow me to beat Lorelei consistently at level 68. Rest, Dig, Mimic, and Rock Slide. Rock Slide allows me to do damage to Dugong first turn, it rests, and then I knock it out over the following two turns. Note that Dugong does like to use rest first turn because Mankey's a fighting type, so that's really consistent. At level 68, Rock Slide's now able to take Cloister into red health and trigger a super potion from Lorelei very regularly. And so with this, I'm able to arrive at Slowbro consistently with green health. Unfortunately here, I no longer have Karate Chop, so I have to use Rock Slide for the first two turns. After that, I use Dig, and the result's still the same. Now this is where the solution is. Jinx follows, and I can mimic Lovely Kiss from it. Lovely Kiss isn't the most accurate move, but it at least allows me to put the strange Psychic Ice type to sleep, rest up, and prepare for Lapras. When Lapras comes out, I can put it to sleep, and with that I can use two Rock Slides to knock it out. If I run out of Rock Slide PP, which does happen occasionally, I can just switch into Dig, and it does roughly the same amount of damage. So with that, I defeat Lorelei five times in a row, and now I'm moving on to Bruno. And I'm actually going to test him today, because the fight during the League that I did in my playthrough was just not consistent. But this time, I'm arriving at a higher level, so I think that I'm going to be fine. Right? Like, I really hope I'm going to be fine for my ego's sake. The problem here with Bruno is that I don't have moves that are very good against his Hitmons. The Hitmonchan has the three elemental punches, and that gives it a lot of status conditions that can really mess up my results. Luckily, I have Rest. I arrive at Hitmonlee, it does a lot of damage to me, so I decide to rest up before the end of the fight. After all, Machamp is pretty powerful if it actually attacks. But today this leads to a defeat because Hitmonlee takes me out before I can wake up. Okay, so I lost to Bruno in a video. That, uh, that doesn't feel good. On the next fight, I actually make a lot of mistakes and I use a rock move on Machamp when I finally get there. Like, what was I doing? But at least I managed to take the victory. I managed to get two victories this way, and on the third fight, Hitmonlee hits me with high jump kick and knocks me out from green health. Okay, so that really isn't encouraging. Maybe I need a different approach. For the next fight, I try a different strategy. I add submission to my moveset, and this allows me to get more consistently past the Onyx and the two Hitmons. After winning one time, I was fairly sure that this was going to be the strategy that would allow me to win. However, the recoil damage from submission really stacks up, and by the time I get to the second Onyx, I really want to rest to heal up my health for the Machamp. I don't want to knock myself out with recoil damage after all. However, this Onyx knows Screech, and if it uses it too much, it can really mess up my results, so I actually end up losing here again. Okay, let's like uh, just pause the video for a moment and just like reflect on the fact that like Bruno actually requires strategy today. Like, I thought my ego would be just like screaming, but I actually feel strangely refreshed. It's nice that this man is actually putting up a fight for once. Normally, he's such a pushover. Anyways, let's get back to it. When I was playing this, I felt that the Onyx using Screech this many times though was not really something that would happen. So I end up going back into the fight and I just get through it with the same moveset that I had and I take five victories. One thing that I think might be possible would be mimicking like Ice Punch from the Hitmonchan and then using that to knock the Onyx out slightly faster than Submission without recoil damage. But in this case, I don't do that and I'm still able to get five victories. But this is a problem because now I'm arriving at Agatha and I have my moveset Rest, Submission, Mimic, Rock Slide. I don't have Dig anymore. And basically what that means is I'm going to have to Mimic Lick from the first Gengar and try to win that way. So now Agatha has become inconsistent because of my moveset that I used against Bruno. So I'm sure some of you have spotted it by now, but for those of you who haven't, I actually missed the best solution for the Bruno fight. But I realized this very early in my attempts against Agatha, so I just decided to reset to Bruno and try it all over again. 
This time, I keep Dig on my moveset, and I'm going to have to rely on it to knock out the first Onyx and the Hitmonchan. But after that, Hitmonlee comes out, and what I failed to recognize is that I can mimic High Jump Kick. Mankey with High Jump Kick? Yeah, this is going to be really good. With this move, I'm able to knock out his following three Pokemon with consistency. I take five victories with ease, the way it should be against Bruno, and now I'm moving on to Agatha with Dig. I'm not even going to test her because I'm a higher level now, I'm outspeeding all of her Pokemon, and she's just going to be extremely easy. There is the possibility of losing if you miss Rock Slide against Golbat, it confuses you and then you hit yourself a bunch and it knocks you out, but I just don't think that that's very likely. Plus she doesn't have good AI, so the Golbat isn't always going to use Wing Attack against you. So, I'm confident that the fight against her is consistent enough and I'm happy to move on. Lance is next, and this was the first major sticking point for Mankey. For this fight, I use rare candies that I would have had in a regular playthrough to level up all the way to level 74 for this fight. I use Rock Slide against Gyarados, and it just survives, and then gets a critical hit and knocks Mankey out. Okay, so uh, that seems like how this fight has to go. It just seems like that's what my fate is, I guess. Unfortunately then, on my second fight, Aerodactyl knocks me out. In the third fight, I decide to level up two more times to level 76 to see if the additional levels help out. But in this case, the second Dragonair actually just freezes me with Ice Beam. Ugh. This is always a risk if you're trying to steal Ice Beam to use it against the Aerodactyl and the Dragonite. In the fourth fight, I'm finally able to take the first victory at level 76, and that's encouraging. But it's important to note that Gyarados is still a range, so that's pretty annoying. In order to increase the consistency here, I actually end up leveling up to level 77 in hopes that it's now going to allow me to one-shot these Pokemon. However, it's worth noting that I'm still not able to win five times in a row. Like, I'm winning a lot at this level, but it's just not quite enough for me to consider that it would be consistent. If I was going into this fight with Mankey and it was a solo Nuzlocke, I would just like not feel confident that I was going to make it through. So to improve consistency, I continue leveling up all the way until level 81. And at this level, there's actually a new consistency advantage. I'm no longer worried about Ice Beam. Rock Slide can knock out all of his Pokemon except the Dragonite in one hit, but Dragonite can't actually deal enough damage to Mankey to knock me out, so I'm just really not concerned. It typically just goes for Thunder, misses, or hits me, and then my second Rock Slide connects and knocks it out. So I've arrived at the champion at level 81, and I think that this is going to be a lot easier now with the additional levels. Now Sandslash isn't doing as much of a percentage damage to me with Slash or Earthquake, so I'm able to mimic Slash more consistently and move on to the rest of the fight. After that, things are actually pretty easy. I can knock the Executor out with Slashes, after that Dig for Magneton, Rock Slide for Cloyster, and then the final Flareon is just going to spam Reflect. So you might ask here, what about Submission, because it would do more damage to the Cloyster and be more likely to one-hit it instead of relying on a two-hit. Well my answer to that is that I was able to complete this fight five times in a row with consistency on my first attempts. I actually didn't lose any fights against the champion with this moveset. And the reason that I like Rock Slide more than Submission is just that it doesn't do recoil damage, and it also has slightly more accuracy. So the additional accuracy is the reason that I was favoring Rock Slide over Submission in this fight. So that's it, Mankey's able to consistently beat the league at level 82. And now it's time to discuss the results that I got in my first playthrough with Mankey. I got a time of 1 hour, 42 minutes and 2 seconds. Mankey finished the game at level 72 with 69 hit points remaining. Nice. 26 resets, and it got a game time of 5 hours and 38 minutes. I think that of these four metrics, I'm most disappointed with the number of resets that it took. There are so many areas where I could just reduce the number of resets with slightly better planning. Against Brock, I could level up a couple more times against the optional trainers in Viridian Forest, making that fight consistent without the need for any resets. Against Koga, I could have delayed the fight longer, and then in the mid game, I could have trained in the gyms to add more levels and add consistency once I arrive at the league. I think if I applied all these things, I'd probably actually clock in with a lower time and with less resets. Thanks so much for watching, I really appreciate it. Like, subscribe, ring the chime echo, and comment because I'm really trying to read them all. And if you've made it this far, you're incredible. Thanks so much for watching. After collecting all this information, I put together... A, what am I saying? I don't know what I'm saying. I'm saying like put together myself a plan. Like that doesn't make any sense. I put a plan together for myself. Ugh. But I actually took... 10 days, but I actually took, but I actually fuck, but I actually fuck a two, ah, uh, what am I saying? I buy two Poké Dolls, one to skip the Marowak in Pokemon Tower, and the other one for Mimic in Celadon City, in Saffron City. Ah, uh, what am I saying? <laughs> I know these games, I swear. I played them enough, I should know them very well by now. I buy two Poké Dolls, one for Pokemon Tower to skip the Marowak, and one to obtain Mimic from the Mimic Girl from Copycat. Her name is Copycat. She has a name. Use her name. Also, these trainers disappear once you defeat Giovanni. 
after also these trainers dis ah ah i can't say this line <laughs> it's so hard disappear needle queen's next it survives my hit on red health and hits me with an earthquake taking Mankey down to 30 thir no it's not 30 it's 60 ah the following turn oh my gosh i just like can't do this turn this is like i cannot narrate this turn come on it's not that hard on the next fight sans sand sand slash oh that's hard Unfortunately, here I no longer have Karate Chop, so I have to rely on Rock Slide. Oh, I can't say Rock Slide. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I head back to. S oh, I hit the desk. <laughs> Try to start the line, hit the desk. Uh, it doesn't work like that. I head back to Sylph to take on the rival. Here I use Karate Chop first turn, and I think that's a mistake. I probably should have just used Dig to try to avoid the Sand Slashes slashes. Uh, that's hard to say. Sand Slashes sash slashes. Ah! <laughs> oh no. 